Hey everybody, welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. It is September 6th, 2022. I'm in I'm in the house of Devo early today. I mean totally early, but um I wanted to get it in. It's a two chapter kind of big devotion and uh, we're going to finish that book of Judges today. So man, I'm really excited to do that. Hey, hope your Labor Day was good. And uh, that was beneficial. Me and Sylvia celebrated our 29th anniversary, wedding anniversary. Boy, that was awesome. You know, just, man, amazing. A lot of beautiful memories and uh, wonderful just making new memories, just being together and hanging out. And um, yeah, so 29th. Yeah, super cool. So anyway, we're going to get into Judges 20. 21 it's a continuation of the last really two chapters so really to understand these thoroughly you got to read the last two chapters at least of the book of judges because the narrative is just continuing on and we keep getting this idea then we're going to get this at the end of the whole book where it says in those days israel had no king every uh everyone did as he saw fit and this is if you will this is the the chorus of the book right that Israel had no king and it just keeps getting kind of shouted from the rooftops and so people are doing every everything that they want hey good morning Ruth very good having you uh this morning so that's kind of the idea is is you know in in the book of Judges you know we we look at our own life as, and in a devotion to God and we go hey God you know help us to to see you as our king help us not live a life uh with no king and no kingdom you know um help us not just go rogue doing things that we want to do and so these next two chapters they might seem like a lot to you but i want you just to get the idea of a place that has no king and really everybody's just doing what they want to do and and so there's not much seeking of the lord um at times there is but there's not just this collective group of people that are going hey we got to go to the central house of the lord you know that place where the tabernacle is that tent of meeting you know <clears throat> let's go to the priest instead everybody even including the priest are just woo out and about doing their thing god help us again to live as Christians that have a king and a kingdom and uh, that that's guiding us in our day to day right and so chapter 20 is like this then all the Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out as one man and assembled before the Lord at Mizpah the leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 soldiers armed with swords. So we get the idea that this is a military effort of all the tribes. And it says these um, 400,000 soldiers armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. Okay, so there's chaos in the 12 tribes. Atrocities, and atrocities specifically mentioned in the prior chapter, that has never happened ever before. And it's shocked the nation, so to speak. Right? Have we ever had something like that where something shocked the nation? Where the nation finally woke up and went, hmm, you know, or do we just go back to normal? Or, or do we just go back to the daily grind in our minds, especially? Or is there something in the nation that shocks it so much that we remember it and that now we take new action, right? I love that, taking new action, seeing something for what it is, knowing that now we know exactly what it is, right? We see the corruption, we see the contamination, we see the distortion. And so the people now rise up and they go, hey, Man, there's something we have to do something and so they say tell us how this awful thing happened and the awful thing was awful you got to go back and read it but it was horrible so the levite the husband of the murderers murdered woman so the levite the husband of the murder woman 
said, I and my concubine came to Gebeah in Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gebeah came after me and surrounded the house, intended to kill me. They raped my concubine and she died. I took my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her uh, sent one piece to each region of is- the Israelite territory because they committed this lewd and disgraceful act in Israel. Now all you Israelites speak up and give your verdict. So he kind of reiterates the narrative, right, of what happened in the prior chapter. Horrible situation. You can go through the details in the prior um, chapter. But anyway, he's he, he's trying to get the attention. This Levite's trying to get the attention of all the tribes to see what one of their tribes did, right? This is not some pagan nation out there. This is kind of that new testament passage in the book of james it's a little spooky but it says judgment begins in the house of god there's a passage that says that we got to look at ourselves as a church we got to look at ourselves as people right as christians and just go hey judgment begins with with me where am i at you know how am i living what what how do i live where do i live what do i do you know what how do i contribute you know um, am I blinded to my own hypocrisies, to my own sinful inclinations? Ooh, something a lot of us don't want to do, right? Ooh, what prevents me from looking at myself? Maybe thinking that I'm saved by my works. See, if I think I'm saved by my works, I'm certainly not going to want to look at myself because that would be the last thing I want to do because I want to actually think that I'm doing good. But if I know I'm saved by grace that wonderful grace of Jesus Christ, then I can come boldly to the throne of grace, right? Knowing that I'm forgiven, knowing that he is sanctifying me, he is doing a work in me, that we can bring those defects to the Lord, those things, those things that are part of me that seem so much a part of who I am. Anyway, so a good devo already, right? Oh, man. And it says, all the people rose as one man, saying, none of us will go home. No, no one of us will return to his house. But now that, that this is what we'll do, now this is what we'll do to Gebeah. We'll go up against it, and, and uh, as the lot directs, we'll take 10 men out of every 100 from the tribes of Israel, and 100 from 1,000, and 1,000 from 10,000, and get provisions for the army. Basically, we're going to go up against Benjamin. That's basically what they're saying. And we're going to do it. We're going to get them. We're going to get them good, right? And it says, then when the army arrives at Gebeah in Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for all this vileness done in Israel. So all the men of Israel got together and united as one man against the city. So we don't see him really going to the Lord. We just see him going, man, we're going to have to get these people, right? and come after him. Hey, thanks so much for the uh, congrats on the anniversary. Appreciate that, Paul. That's awesome. And so I think that's good. A big thing too is like, hey, we got to remember to go before the Lord, right? To go to God before we go and do our thing, seek our vengeance, right? Have that big conversation, whatever it is. Let's seek the Lord first, right? Let's really go before the Lord. And it says, the tribes of Israel sent men throughout the tribe of Benjamin saying, what about this awful crime and what was committed among you? Now surrender those wicked men of Gebeah so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns, they came together at Gebeah to fight against the Israelites. Okay, we got civil war going, right? We got the tribe of Benjamin against all the other tribes. Remember Benjamin? Remember what that name even means? Benjamin? I'll let you look that up. But yeah, Benj- there's a history with the the person Benjamin, right? And uh, how much he was beloved by his father. And uh, so it's sad to see the tribe just go astray in such a horrible way, right? So now civil war, they're on the brink of it. And um, it talks about, you know, the... Uh, the amazing soldiers that were involved in their skills, things like that. So Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordmen, all of the fighting men. 
And the Israelites went up to Bethel to inquire of the Lord. Okay, so now we see them inquiring of the Lord at Bethel. And they say, who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjamites? The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. The next morning, the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gebeah. The men of Israel went out to fight the Benjamites and took up a battle position against them from Gebeah. The Benjamites came out of Gebeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. Ouch, right? That's a lot of people. Then the men of Israel grew, uh, of Israel, um, then the men of Israel encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. There Israel went up and wept before the Lord until eating, and they inquired of the Lord. They said, Shall we go up against, uh, again to fight uh, against Benjamin, our brothers? And the Lord answered, Go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day, this time when the uh, Benjamites came out from Gebeah to oppose them. They cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. Isn't this crazy? They're going up now to inquire of God. Should we go fight our brothers? God says, well, go for it. You know, and what do they do? They get they get really injured bad. I mean, they get a lot of people killed, 20,000 in one shot, 18,000 in another. So the Israelites are confused probably at this time. What are we doing? What are we doing wrong? Well, maybe, maybe what God required is their heart. Maybe instead of them just being so bent on revenge and things like that, maybe they needed to learn how to come before God with a broken and a contrite heart for the nation's sins, meaning meaning they were focused on Benjamin's sins for sure. And Benjamin did have sins in their camp. There's no doubt about that. But there's no doubt either that the rest of the tribes had their own issues going on as well. So many different issues. One of them being that they never got rid of all the people that lived in the land that were in, in, into paganism and things like that. They never, they never did what they were supposed to do. Maybe they needed to just come to God and just say, hey, God, you know what? With a broken and contrite heart. But they didn't. Now, now the Israelites, they go up to Bethel and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. So now they bring the offerings. Now they start maybe going back to what they know they're supposed to do. You know, not just go before God, but go go before God with an offering. Remember, offering means to draw near. So now maybe they're really starting to get the ideas. Hey, maybe we need to really draw close to God, you know, and not just go to him for some, you know, magic spell thing. You know, just like, hey, put in a quarter and you get something back from God. Not that kind of relationship with God right? That vending machine relationship with the deity that so many people have, right? If I just say this a certain way, God's going to give me that. No, but now their heart really is, man, I want more of God. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in Bethel, right? With Phinehas, son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. And they asked, shall we go up against the battle with Benjamin, our brothers, or not? Laura says, finally, they inquired of God before going into battle, but they should have started with reconciliation of their own sins. Healing a nation starts at home first. Oh, so true. Yeah, that's what I see in this section too. Hey, before maybe I judge others, maybe I need to deal with my heart. Does that sound a little bit like Jesus, right? Right? Maybe I need to look at my own speck in my own eye, and then maybe I'll be able to see clearly right? The speck that's in my, my brother or sister's eye, you know, that kind of thing. Then Israel set an ambush around Gebeah. So now they come at it, or by the way, the Lord says, hey, go, I'm going to give them into your hands. So this time God says, hey, do it, you know, go, I, they're going to, you're going to win. And it's, so victory happens now as they come to the Lord in honesty, broken and contrite. So Israel sets an ambush around Gebeah. They went up against the Benjamites the third day. Hey, that third day, that's come in play before in the Old Testament, the third day. And the Israelites set an ambush around Gebeah, and they went up against Benjamin on the third day and took up positions, right? And the Benjamites came out to meet them and were drawn. 
and uh, it says they began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before, so that about 30 men fell in the open field. And, and it says while the Benjamites were saying we're defeating them before uh, the Israel, um, as before, the Israelites were saying let's retreat and draw away. And then Israel, again, the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions at Baal Tamar. And the Israelites ambushed, uh, charged out of his place on the west of Gebeah. So you get an idea that there was like a different strategy used here. One that's kind of Joshua oriented. The ambush takes place, drawing people away from the the city, and then there's like these. Then you kind of get them cornered, kind of thing. And it says, "Now the men of Israel had given way before J- J- ben- Benjamin, because they relied on ambush, and they had set near Gebeah. The men who had been in ambush made a sudden dash to Gebeah, and it goes into more detail of the battle." Um, and and it keeps going and and it says on that day 25,000 benjamite swordsmen fell all of them vigilant fighters but 600 men turned and fled into the desert so we have 25,000 benjamites die in this battle right and we have 600 men flee into the rocks of rimen rimen and they stayed there and um and then the men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword including the animals and everything that they found and the towns they came across they set on fire wow so they literally it's interesting the things that they were supposed to do to the pagans quote the pagan people of Canaan they end up doing that now to Benjamin right to the tribe of Benjamin wow I mean just can you get a load of how crazy it gets right now, I don't know if they went on, if they're going rogue themselves, and maybe they shouldn't have been burning everything, and maybe they shouldn't have been killing everything in Benjamin. Maybe they should have just went to war, and after the war, went home. But they, they went, and they, they burned, and quite a scene. Then the men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah, not one, not one, not one of what? Let me flip the page. Not one of us will give our daughters to marriage um, of any Benjamite. Wow. Remember, they only got so many men left, right, of the tribe of Benjamin. So the people went to Bethel where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. O Lord, the God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. So they are drawing near to God. They are coming to God. They see just the yuck of it all. They see, oh, have you ever seen the yuck of you all? Have you ever, you know, have seen the yuck of me all? Have you ever looked at yourself and just went, man, boy, do I need the Lord? Boy, a burnt offering is like a dedicated offering. It's like an offering of everything to you or to the Lord. You know, have you ever just gone, man, Lord, I need you to take everything everything because everything needs you everything is corrupted lord i need you i need to surrender everything to you Mm. yeah it's a good heart to have and it says then the israelites asked who from all the tribes of israel has failed to assemble before the lord for they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the lord at mizpah should certainly be put to death Now the Israelites grieved for their brothers, the Benjamites. Today, one tribe is cut off from Israel. They said, how can we provide wives for those who are left since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? One of the things about the book of Judges we've learned too is maybe not to give, you know, rash judges or um, oaths. You know, they, in the book of Judges, we see a few oaths that are taken that are really, mm, really rough, you know, like promises to God. That really, man, shouldn't have been said. You know, we got to really watch that always. You know, don't just say, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, God. And it's just something that's really we we just didn't have to say. Remember, these guys all said, hey, we're not going to give our daughters, you know, no way to the Benjamites. But now they're bummed. They want to see Benjamin grow. They want that tribe to live on, to be a part of the entire community of Israel. You know, that's like our families, right? When something happens to one, man, it should burden us. It should be something that weighs on our hearts. That's a good burden to carry. We don't carry it alone, of course, 
but it's it's something that we do have in our heart you know we like to see you know peace in the unit right we want to see peace in our in the unit that we have as a family and it's a bummer when that unity is broken and things aren't going too well and so it says that um you know they assemble before mispah and um you know, it says when they asked which of one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah, they discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had come to the camp for the assembly. For when they continued, uh, counted the people, they found that none of the people from Jabesh Gilead were there. And um, so they see this one area where the people of Jabesh Gilead were not present uh, at this meeting. And so because of that, um, remember, there was like they were supposed to all assemble before the Lord. So now they're going, hey, why isn't the, this, these one people from Jabesh Gilead, you know, present? You know, where are they? You know, um, you know, why aren't they present? Now, notice what happens. So the assembly set 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to what? Jabesh Gilead. And put to the sword those living there, including the women and the children. Oh, man, dude, it just gets crazy, right? They go to Gilbesh Gilead, Jabesh Gilead, and they go to this area, um, which is a part of one of the tribes, and they, they just literally obliterate everybody. They say, well, hey, because you didn't go before the Lord at Mizpah, you know, while we were weeping for what just happened, we just had civil war with Benjamin. And we're sitting there weeping as a collective group. And where are you guys at? Why don't you guys show up? We're just going to go, hey, we're just going to go kill you. So they go and they wipe, they kill them. They kill everything, right? Um, and, and they put to the sword women and children. Now, this is what you are to do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Gabesh, uh, Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who, were never, who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. Then the whole assembly sent for, uh, to offer, uh, uh, sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimmon. So the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of J, uh, Jabesh Gilead who had been spared. But they were not enough for all of them. The people grieved for Benjamin. Now this is now it starts getting all bizarre again, right? Man, it seems like it's going well. It seems like hey, we're finally repenting. Hey, we're finally getting to the place where man. And then what happens? Boom, man! You just get right back into it. Oh boy, have you ever had that happen, man, in your life? Where man, you you strive to do the right thing. You want to, you know, grow. You start going, you start dedicating your life to God. And then you find yourself going right back to the things that which you, you shouldn't do. You, you, maybe you shouldn't kill, you know, everybody in, in Jabesh, Gilead, and wipe everybody out, you know, and do this whole thing. Maybe, maybe that you shouldn't have done that, you know, maybe you shouldn't be so violent, right? Maybe you shouldn't try to fix everything. Um, maybe you're a fixer and you just want to fix everything um, and that kind of thing. You know, you know, so, you know, I think there's something to us there that we are fixers and sometimes we want to control everything. But in our wanting to control everything, man, we just make things worse. We're just living out of fear and insecurities and, and man, all that stuff just messes everything up, right? Instead of trusting God. God needs to fix people. I can't fix people. God needs to. I need to just stand before the Lord. Wait to listen on God. You know, not just react. Not just do what I think. Not just try to control and make things right when things have been so wronged. You know, that kind of thing. So they think, hey, we're doing the right thing. We just gave Benjamin some virgins so they can have wives. Because there's not many men and there's no more women. So we got we to gotta get them women. Women. So the people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. And the elders of, uh, of the assembly said, With the women of Benjamin destroyed, how shall we provide wives for the men who are left? The Benjamite survivors have their heirs. Uh, and they said, uh, So that a tribe of Israel will not be wiped out, we can't give them 
uh, our daughters as wives, since we Israelites have taken this oath. Remember, they made that oath. Cursed be anyone who gives a wife to the Benjamite. But look, there is the annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh to the north of Bethel and east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem and to the south of Lebanon. Lebanon. Uh, so they instructed the Benjamites saying, go and hide in the vineyards and watch. Now this is interesting. Go hide in the vineyards and watch. Then the girls of Shiloh, Shiloh um, who, com who come out to join in the dancing, then rush the vineyards, uh, rush from the vineyards. Each of you sees a wife from the girls of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers and brothers complain to us, we will say to them, do, do us a kindness by helping them because uh, uh, we did not get wives for them during the war and you are innocent since you did not give your daughters to them. So this is what the Benjamites did. While the girls were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off uh, to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt their towns and settled in them. At that time, the Israelites left the place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to their own inheritance. So, man, what a mess. I mean, this is just absolutely crazy. And what is the last line? In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was saw fit. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? It ends again on that line. And so Benjamin gets their wives. They have this festival, these Young girls come dancing. They have this thing. The people of Israel say, hey, we, we feel so bad that you, why don't you guys just, you know, kind of go capture a woman? I mean, oh, you just kind of go, oh, whoo, you know, man, the book of Judges is one of those great books on human behavior, right? And the reason why it's so wonderful, because it, it shows in all of the gory detail just how depraved we really are, you know. And, you know, it's not good for humans to know God without knowing their own depravity, right? If we know God without knowing our own depravity, we just become narcissistic and proud and puffed up and self-righteous. We must understand our depravity as we know God. We must know that we are fragile, and that if we leave the place of God, the place of meeting with God, right, our relationship with Christ, on even a minute-by-minute -minute day, part of the day, we, too, can become so far away, become just like anybody who doesn't know God, right? We can become filled with self-righteousness if we don't understand our depravity where we think we really got it together, where we think we can really make choices, where we think we really have it all, and we can just complain at everybody else, instead of realizing that we too so desperately need the Savior, and that the way we get into the kingdom and a part of the covenant is by grace, right? Not by our works, right, that produce self-righteousness. So to me, the book of Judges is a great book, it's a good book because it is so true that if you know God without knowing your own depravity, mm, then look out, humans will go nuts, right? And we will have so many problems. So we must know our depravity as we're getting to know God. And, and what a great book to be able to look at it and go, hey, I see me in it. I see me how squirrely I get. I see how interesting it is for me to waver. I see how interesting it is me to not draw near, but to move away. To want to isolate, not deal with things. You know, find it, find, go away. You know, things like that. Instead of come to God and learn how to find my peace and rest in the Lord and in Him alone. So, man, to me, great book. Hope you guys enjoyed it. You guys take care, okay? next or tomorrow new book okay bye-bye